there. You are listening to Revenue Insights. Today, I'm joined by Bob Marsh. He's a sales keynote speaker and chief revenue officer at Blue Water. He spent his career in sales and sales leadership roles at companies including Level 11 and Hello World. Bob, great to have you on the show. How are you? Great. Thanks, Lee. Good to be, good to be here. Appreciate it. Looking forward to our chat. Yeah, likewise. Um, I, I gave a bit of a bit of a, a very high level overview there of kind of your background. But for anyone listening that perhaps hasn't come across any of your keynotes or your or your speaking, uh, what's your story? Yeah, sure. So uh, today, you know, I'm very active as a keynote speaker and also an active chief revenue officer. But uh, kind of the, the the background here. So so first of all, a little personal. So I uh, I'm I currently live in metropolitan Detroit. This is where I was born. Um, I actually grew up in a small town outside of Buffalo, New York, called Orchard Park. Um, was there in middle school and high school. Um, I grew up. And it's funny. I, I think about you know sales. Like I, I always loved the little contests we'd have at school, selling Easter candy or whatever it might be. I always did well, so that was maybe my entry into sales, and I didn't realize it. Um, but I grew up uh, playing uh, competitive golf in high school and in college, and I never was great or anything, but like loved the game, still do. Um, learned a lot about being on a team and competitiveness and the whole thing. Uh, so like I said, currently I live in metropolitan Detroit. This is my home, kind of always will be. Um, happily married, got three young kids. Um, so so active in that, in that way too. So really my first, uh, my, my very first entry into sales was, well, probably no surprise, selling golf equipment. Uh, worked in a sporting goods store during college. Um, just as a way to, you know, figure out a way to make money and being in golf. It was something I was very comfortable with. Um, and, and I share that because it was actually you know, really telling about, you know, the, my philosophy, which I've continued to hang on to. So um, it turns out I was really successful at that. I did a great job. I sold, the, the, the manager of the store told me that I sold more than any salesperson in the history of the store, which I never knew. He didn't tell me that's my last day, uh, which is kind of a kind of a nice surprise. Nice. Um, and, you know, one of the things that surprised me about that was that I actually never felt like I was selling anybody anything. I was just helping people figure out what they needed. And I was in my element in golf, but people would walk in. I learned how do I disarm them? How do I overcome the barrier and resistance they have to work with a salesperson? Um, and I just try to build a trusted relationship and I just help them figure out what was right for them. I wasn't trying to sell the most expensive or the latest and greatest. It was like everything's unique to the customer and I tell them what they need and I tell them to go to some other store if I thought it made sense for them. Um, and overall, that approach of really being genuine, caring and helping people um, I, has really kind of been a guidepost for me uh, throughout my entire career. What I what really stood out for me from that, and having spoken to lots of folks like before, is so often people in sales are like, I, I kind of fell into it. But I feel like with your background, playing competitive golf, and then working at a golf store, actually, you're probably the perfect match for going into a sales career that I've uh, <laughs> well, maybe, may, so. may, maybe met so far. And my dad was in sales, you know, it was like, you know, hey, it just it just happened. Yeah. And um, I, I'm interested, perhaps, to dig into a little bit more around um, that you, your philosophy. You were mentioning there taking an approach that's genuine and caring and helpful. And that's something that resonates as I it's come up a, uh, on the podcast quite a lot recently, you know, almost this move away from uh, like efficiency, like um, uh, treating sales almost as like a machine that can be, uh, for want of a better word, predictable. And we put more in at the top of the machine that churns more out the end. Um, could you speak a bit more to to your philosophy specifically and, and how kind of that experience is kind of carried through into your career? Sure, you bet. So, so my, my general philosophy is some of the things I just talked about. I mean, selling, you know, so I, people ask me sometimes, like if you could wave, someone asked me this a couple weeks ago, if you could wave a magic wand over the world of business, like what would you change? And my answer was, I would completely reset what people think sales is about. Because so often customers and salespeople go through this awkward phase when we're just trying to figure out, do we trust each other? And, you know, and it's something that as sellers, we need to figure out how to overcome. It's a waste of time for customers because they're trying to figure out who should I trust? Who can I really listen to? And so, so really, if you think about that, I mean, the, the, my, my mission and goal in life is to kind of change the world of sales and to get people to look at, you know, what a seller, you know, I think of selling as the phrase, the word has all these connotations. Like I'm in sales, I'm selling, 
as though it's something I'm doing to somebody. And that's the part that I think is an error as a mindset. And really to do it well, you've got to be helping a customer make a decision. You know, we're more in the art of how do I enable people to make decisions with confidence? Um, so, so I would say like overall, like that's kind of my philosophy. And what I, what I find is, and this is what drove me to, you know, doing the, the concept of what I call selling with simplicity, leading with simplicity, growing with simplicity, that when you apply these simple concepts, that they can help people sell better, they can help companies grow faster. And to me, most importantly, we can create a better experience for our customers in working with us. Now, I want to touch on one of the points you mentioned. First of all, I am a deep and big believer in the use of technology, finding efficiencies, using technology, using data, you know, all these things, they're wildly important, but they need to be kind of coming what they can't be the foundation of what your sales experience is about. They enable the experience you bring to customers, which has got to be driven by being genuine, wanting to help, being confident in what and how you carry yourself, being an expert at what you do, using technology to guide people through decisions to help them get to the right answers all on their own, um, and, and, and organizing our time effectively so that we can make the greatest impact. And a lot of those things are little tidbits that I talk about very deeply in my keynote speech. But you know, there's, a, there's an important marriage of technology and how you just provide a great, genuine customer experience. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's certainly come across a lot in, in conversation that I've had. Of it's, you know, you've almost got two different ends of the spectrum, but you've got to bring them both together to really get the, uh, the full effect of it. And mm -hmm. where I'm interested perhaps to, to dig into a little more then is um, as I listen to you talk about um, uh, this kind of philosophy of selling with simplicity, you know, as a, um, as, as a marketer, it speaks a lot to me because it's, um, it is almost like a pure, pure form of selling in a way, um, for, for want of a better word. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, to your point, very simple and in theory, you know, should be simple to implement. And yet in the day and age that we're in, it just doesn't seem to be happening. And to your point, there's the, the connotation that kind of goes with sales that we're doing it um, for, um, for the reason that we are doing it, as opposed to doing it from a position of, of helping people. So what would you say are the root causes then of, of why we're not approaching sales in that way currently? Mm -hmm. so, so one thing is that I would tell you that selling with simplicity is not simple. Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard. Um, and there's a difference between simplicity and simple. So like, you know, simple implies like, oh, it's a piece of cake and I just got to use, but you know, there, there, it takes, it takes some effort. And so, um, what, what I would tell you is that the, the shift as, as you're asking about is, is there's the, far too many people spend time thinking about ourselves and our message and what we're trying to get across and the numbers that I'm trying to achieve as opposed to having the mindset on, on the customer and what's the customer looking for and how are they receiving information? How are they making decisions? And, you know, having that in mind. No. So let me give you an example. I, um, I was recently talking with a, um, I recently met somebody and they met, we met at a conference and they want to, you want to talk about doing a research project together. He sends me, he sends me an email the next day that is like literally like four pages of scrolling text. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you think I'm going to do with that email? Uh, put it into chat GPT and summarize it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that would be investing some time. There's, there's only two things that happen in a scenario like that. Yeah. Delete. Or if I'm well-intentioned, say, I remember that guy. I do want to follow up, but I'll get to it later. Mm. And get to it later in today's day and age means it's probably never going to happen. Mm. And what I see over and over again through now through LinkedIn, we're getting slammed with this stuff and email, these, these unclear, unhelpful, non-personalized email messages, LinkedIn messages, et cetera, that aren't actually accomplishing anything. I'll give you a little, another little story. I, had a, I was on, I was actually speaking with a, um, an, a, a client at a, a, an audience and I went through this example that I just talked about. And I said, oh, I took this long email 
I rewrote it and only hit the key points. It was really short and to the point. And, and the, and the, one of the sales people in the audience came up and like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like your whole thing about the, the writing and the thing, like, that's so simple. Like I don't, and I get lost in trying to write all the perfect messages and everything. He said, I'll, let me tell you a story of this. He goes, I, I have recently written this like template email that has everything about me and my company. And I sent it to people and it's like, I'm so proud of it. It covers all the key points. And I think my target customer is all the information they want, they'd want to find out. I was not seeing a lot of response to it. But the thing is, anytime someone did respond, they were the most common response was, can you give me an idea of how much this costs? And he said, you know what? That was in that email. But no one ever saw it. Because it was too long, too clear, too, co- too unclear, too, uh, too overcomplicated, that even the information that I had given them had not been seen because I made this thing so complicated. So, so, and we see little examples of this over and over again and the way we price things, the way we have a conversation, the way we present a proposal, the way we send, inundate people with sales collateral material that they just like, my head's going to close. I can't think about all this. So the idea of kind of learning the, the art of how do I synthesize down what's most important, communicate with, with confidence and clarity, that can be the difference maker. I love that. And that, Leads me to what I feel like is the obvious question: is how do how do I do that? And and I can I can resonate with this a lot, uh, coming at it from a marketing perspective, and it's very much the same mentality when you are copywriting, for example, where it's I'm trying to take my whole proposition of my product, and I'm now trying to condense that down, and to use your word, to yes. synthesize that down into a headline for my website, and I'm. You know, I'm sat there pulling out my hair going, oh, but, you know, it's really short and punchy, but it doesn't explain this part of my product, it doesn't explain that. So I, I'd love to hear how you approach it yes. uh, in, in order and two how things. to do it. You bet. Two, two things. One, what is the, if there's one result that I want out of this message, this email, what is it? What is my primary objective of this message? Usually, it's not to share every piece of information they might possibly need. That is often what we think. I'm trying to share everything they might possibly be thinking about and we make sure it's covered. That's an error. What's the one thing I'm trying to get out of this email? And sometimes it's as simple as I just want them to respond. I just want them to say, sure, I'd like to learn more. Okay, so start there. What is the one thing that I'm, the primary goal that I'm trying to get out of this? Number two, just draft it. Just start writing. Just draft it. Don't overthink it. Um, one of my one of my favorite quotes is from Mark Twain, and he said, "I'm sorry this letter is so long. I didn't have much time to write it." So, so that second phase is to then re is to review it, put yourself in the mind of the recipient, and keep in mind this is a busy person, like all of us. Their attention span is very short. They're getting 120 to 200 emails every day. They pick up their phone 350 times a day. They're getting slammed with social media messages. People are coming at, that's the person you're sending this to. So with that in mind, now start rewriting, understanding what, again, what's your goal. And remember that this person doesn't have a lot of time. They're going to open that email. They're going to give a quick glance and then decide, am I going to keep going or am I going to, or am I going to move on? So little things that I do, like very tactical. So, so that's kind of the mindset. One, what's your goal? Two, put yourself in the mind of the recipient. And then how would you want to write it? What I find myself doing when I get in those phases of editing, I'm deleting, I'm using bullet points that are super short. I ask what I want right out of the gate. So it's very clear. I use bolding when I can. So I'm just trying to make it easy so that I could scan this and I could say, oh, okay, this, this is clear what I'm, what I'm getting into. So that's uh, that, that for an email, that's how I'd suggest it. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the same things I would tell you about a meeting, about a proposal, I could go on and on, but I would say sending a prospecting email, sending a, a follow-up email to a customer, um, those are the two things to think about. I, I love that. And I want to pick up on, you mentioned earlier around, um, I think when you were originally talking about one of the stories there around uh, research and a research project. And actually, um, I want to dig into perhaps, you know, as you say, there's so many community, you know, emails, LinkedIn that go out unpersonalized, it's super generic. Um, certainly folks that I speak to, they've got 
hundreds of these things coming into their inbox every single day. And it's all about, you know, how do I cut through the noise? And what, certainly from my perspective, and I'm guessing from yours as well, you're seeing the shift now more towards personalization again. So what is your opinion and approach to the research side to being able to write more personalized messages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, this comes back to the whole idea of like, do you generally want to help people? Like that's kind of, that's the, that's the, at the fundamental level, like that's the mindset that you've got to have. Do I want to help people? Because if I want to help people, then I don't want to waste time trying to chase down people who I can't help. So, so the, where, where I would start that is, so, so first of all, you're right. I mean, it, it is unbelievable. The amount, I mean, the amount of messages that I get as a CRO, like the amount of messages that I get every day over email or LinkedIn, that there's no personalization or, or I should like, they may think it's personalized because it's insert my name, insert my title, insert my company name. That's about as far as the personalization goes. That's not personalization in 2023. Like that's just not okay. So, um, but the other thing is when I look at these, not only is the personalization really weak, what they're presenting is not even relevant to me. So, so that's kind of where I want you to go is relevant. And you need to be able to decide yourself, why is what I'm saying relevant? Relevant, we might think, oh, well, because, you know, I'm all about uncovering more opportunities. So that's relevant to everyone. Who wouldn't want that? Or I, I can help you close deals faster. Who wouldn't want that? It's not specific enough. It's just not. Like, you can't call and be like, hey, do you want more sales? We should talk. It's like, I don't, right, right, I don't believe you. That's not specific enough. That doesn't make any sense to me. Of course I want more sales. But, but why, well, I'm not going to answer that. I'm not going to respond to that email. So, so what, what's, what's key is to understand truly who is your ideal customer, title, company, psychographics, the way that they think, the way the company operates. The more narrow and, and specific you can get, the better. So that when you present something as, I, here's where I think I can help you, you can communicate with conviction, with specificity. You can reference other clients or similar people that you've worked with that are going to make a lot of sense. So, so that's kind of when I think of personalization is first start with the right people in the first place. Second is be specific about where you can help them. Now, this kind of actually goes into something that, the, that customers are looking for, they, they're craving, and not enough people can do it, is to be able to communicate with confidence. And I see far too many sellers they kind of have this mindset of subservience to the customer. They look at the customer, they put them up on a pedestal and it comes off in the way that they talk. It comes, comes off in the way they carry themselves. It comes off in the way that they write. They're timid. They're not clear. They're not succinct. They're not specific. And it also comes off in the questions they don't ask because they're afraid of how they're going to be perceived. When you actually have confidence, it's because you know you can bring something of value. And when you believe that, that means you believe that you can help somebody. So now tailor my message to be more specific of here's specifically how I can help you. Here's a challenge that many people like you are having. And I can be more specific about why, why exactly I can help. So it really starts with being extremely crisp about who the right customer is and why. So that then you can communicate more succinctly about where you can actually help. Mm. And if, uh, if I imagine like, folks listening to this will probably be in the shoes of, okay, the, uh, I love everything you're saying, but I'm in a position right now where my, you know, perhaps my team's under the cost, you know, uh, perhaps they're running a, a leaner ship than perhaps ever before, certainly the, than in recent years. And the pressure's really on to be able to hit their number and the target that, that, that is over their head at this point. Um, and so how would you approach changing the mindset of that sales team away from, you know, you're here to do this job. And I think that puts them almost as like a, uh, I can't think of a better word for it, but but a, a robot in a way, if, you know, you are here to send emails, to book meetings, to close deals, and so on and so forth, as a per and changing that mindset into you are here to help people. And sometimes that means saying no to people. Sometimes that means, you know, we're not the right, provider for you and actually you should go and check out these guys because they're the ones that can really help you mm -hmm. yeah so so first of all um nothing that that uh that i'm saying goes against the importance of 
uh, of selling as much as you can, understanding that that's what your role, and anybody should be measured and rewarded and incentivized on winning business, 100%. So I am not proposing, let's just make a big team of helpers. You know, <laughs> it's, sure. it's, a, it's a mindset of the very top performing salespeople, that's the way that they think. They don't think that they can make anybody buy anything. They don't, because they know that they can't. What they can do is they can help people understand the right decision. So let me go, let me get more specifically to the, what I know the heart of your question is. Um, is the, 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 is the key is like, if you're, if you're in that stuck in that data, Hey, I'm just, I'm just being charged with like, I got to send, you know, 147 emails every day and it goes on to report. That's my boss is asking me, like, I get it. But if you're in an environment where you can start saying, Hey, can I try a new approach? Hey, can we, can I, you know, can I test a new approach? Can we all get together and talk about this now as a CRO? Cause I've done this multiple times. Um, off what you need to do is let me pull the whole team together and let's start, let's start talking about what, first of all, what's our objective? What are we trying to accomplish? And then start talking about who is our ideal customer profile. Let me look at the last, like everyone talked about the last like five, five projects you've won. Where did it come from? Why, why did they buy? Who is the person we were dealing with? What do the sales processes look like? Were there any obstacles that we overcame along the way? Okay. Let's talk about the last five times we lost. Why do we lose? Where the lead came from? At what point did we think that we realized this thing was probably going south? Is there anything in retrospect we could have done that we could have overcome it? Anything we could have done differently? What I find in those, first of all, those conversations have to be had with an entire sales team together and marketing leaders, sales leaders, maybe even other executives in the company so that everyone can kind of start seeing and understanding what's going out there in the market and where you as a company can truly be successful. So when you identify that first and everyone's on the same page, it becomes a lot easier to say, okay, so this is the type of customer that we're trying to find because they move faster through the sales process. They're, they're, we're going to win the type of projects that we want because they're the right size. They're highly profitable. They're easy to work with. Now, everyone now suddenly is on the same page about, okay, who are the type of customers we're going after? And also, who are the type of customers we're going to avoid? Now, it's easy to say that, sitting here on a podcast, having a conversation, like, here's the customers you're going to say no to. But if you, and it, what, what I mean by this is when you define, I like to think of it as a, uh, as a dartboard. You know, when you're throwing darts, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do when you're throwing darts? Uh, I want that treble 20 to get 60, right? There you, yeah, you're trying to hit the triple 20, okay? Or you're trying to hit a bullseye, whatever, might, depending on what game you're playing. I want to hit that bullseye, or I want to hit that triple 20, no doubt about it. And that's maybe where I'm aiming and where I'm trying to go, right? But that's not going to happen every time. But that's where I can put my effort. That's where I can put my focus and my attention. So you think about the bullseye is where you focus your outbound effort, where you focus your marketing efforts. This is the perfect profile customer, highly profitable, efficient sales process, low effort sales process, high profitability, high win rate, et cetera. That's where I'm going to focus my outbound attention. If other people outside of that bullseye come to me, I'm not going to say no. I mean, unless it's clearly not a fit. I'm not going to say no. I will, I will field it. I'll explore it. I'll find out, like, does it make sense? Does it, the budget make sense? Is there the right profile customer? Like the faster I can, I think, disqualify it, the better. But the key is when you define it, that's where you put your outbound focus and effort because now all of a sudden, now you're going to get the entire, you know, organization, sales leaders, executive uh, operations leaders, customer success leaders, marketing leaders say, okay, yes, I see. Now we're going to focus in and go proactive at the type of customers we want because that's going to move the needle in this company a heck of a lot faster than just pounding away at a very broad profile that is just, to me, an enormous amount of waste of time and effort for the sales organization. Because you think about it, a company spending a lot of money on sales and marketing, and if it's not hyper-targeted in the right area, you're just, you're just wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. Mm. I, I, I want to pull, um, as you started to talk about that, uh, you mentioned you know, um, the mindset of top performers. And I, I, I'm very curious to know, because from, uh, so from some research that we did, uh, suggests that somewhere around about 27% 20, 20, of reps are hitting 
quota currently. So there's a big disparity between those who are hitting quota, i.e. like your top performers and the rest of the pack. How how do you approach understanding what your uh the the uh the, your top performers, the stars in your team are doing that you can learn from uh to then deploy to the rest of the sales org? Yeah. Uh, I I find that there's four there's four key characteristics. First is that they carry themselves with confidence. They they look like they've been there. They carry themselves like they believe in what they're doing because they do, um, and they communicate with clarity and conviction. And the reason that's important is because customers can sense that and they can feel it. If I if you carry yourself well, you you dress like a professional, which doesn't mean like being out of place, but like. You look like you've been there before. You look like you're the kind of person that regularly talks to people like me or people that are in even more senior than me. Like you've got to carry yourself with confidence because what it does is it makes the customer confident in you and you eliminate all this noise around like, oh, is this person really legit? Like they don't look like they really, you know, that they're really kind of an expert at what they do. So cats there, they have confidence and conviction in what they're doing. Not arrogance, that's annoying, but confidence and clarity, which comes from a whole number of things that I talked about. Second is that they have a very unique ability to go very deep on what the customer needs and what they want. Um, they, you know, they're, they're not so focused on let me deliver the exact right pitch. They're not focused on let me make sure I get this presentation nailed, you know, but they're really good at asking questions and probing deeply to understand what the customer wants. And what I've seen the very, very best they ask questions that make the customer realize like, geez, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. Or you might say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question, but let me get you in front of my CMO, my VP of sales, because they can answer those kinds of questions. That to me, that's that what the expert does, the, the great performer. They get the customer to start thinking about like, geez, I never thought about that. Okay, that's the second one. Third is they have talked about the idea of and you know, they're not selling, they're helping. I think of it as they have this mindset that they are walking the customer through a journey. So the mindset is not, I have a sales process. It's the buyer has a buying process and I am leading them through that. I'm helping them understand what are the, who are all the different players in the market? What are the blind spots that you might have as a customer that I'm going to help you fill? What are the things you're not thinking about in this decision? Um, they're, they're, they're thinking several steps ahead about, okay, here's what happens next. Here's the people that I need, we need to talk to to get in front of. Here's, you know, you know, here's a timeline that goes back from when you want to get, go live with this to when I need a decision to the conversations we need to have today. The customer feel like you are pulling that customer along versus being pulled by the customer through that process. They may not feel that way, but they're very good at leading the journey, as I call it, uh, of the customer through that purchasing process. The fourth and final thing, and, that, and by the way, that whole leading the journey is all about decision making and ask, and like presenting options artfully and how to help people like think through options. Is it one option, five options, three options, like working through all that. The final one is, is something that I, 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 is not about the customer. It's about yourself. Um, I, I've never really liked the idea of um, time management because I think it, pl- it implies like, hey, let me just try to get through my to-do list faster or that it's about the clock. And I'm, hey, I'm a, but I've also been fascinated about how, you know, some people are so wildly successful, but there aren't common characteristics of like top athletes, top executives, top teachers, top professors. Like there's, there's all, they all, some people are just really good at, ach- at achieving at high levels, but there isn't a common characteristic. But what I have found about those people is they're not good about managing their time. They're good about managing their impact. And it's more specifically what I mean is, you think about what are the things that I can doing can do that would have the biggest impact on my happiness, my health, my customers, whatever it might be. So the most common situation with a, say, with a salesperson, most typically, is things like, I never feel like I have enough time in the day. And you say, all right, what would you say is the one thing that you need, that needs to happen more often that you just never seem to have the time? And they'll say things like research or chasing new business. I'm getting so busy in the whirlwind of reacting to customers, I don't put enough time in a new business. Okay, those are two examples, two of the most common examples that I hear, okay? Then we'll say, okay, well, let's take a look at your calendar. 
Do you have any time carved out for research? Do you have time carved out for just making calls and, and going after new business every single day? And so often the case is no, because they're living this reactive life where their meeting gets, their calendar gets filled by other people's priorities, not your own priorities. And a, a simple example is, let's just say, for example, you have a meeting, let's just say new business or, or, or research is something you got to spend a little more time on so you can prospect better. Well, let's say you have a meeting this Thursday at 11 o'clock, a client meeting, okay, an important client meeting. Someone calls you and says, hey, can we meet on Thursday at 11 o'clock? It's very simple to say, well, no, I'm not available. You know, if you're your boss, a senior executive, even like your most ideal customer that you want to win, are you available on Thursday, 11 o'clock? No, I'm sorry, I'm not because I got this other client. So why do we do that on things that are important? Why do we do the same thing to say, you know what? The big, the most impactful thing that I can do to go drive new business is I got to spend 30 minutes every day doing research. Now I'm going to do that at 1030 every day. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, are you available on 1030 at, at Tuesday? Why isn't your answer no? Because you say, ah, I'll put that off. I'll do it another time. I'll skip it. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be flexible. But that mindset shift of there's time that I need for me to achieve my goals and really create maximum impact that we've got to be more deliberate and focused about. Um, so that's all about time management, or as I call it, impact management. I absolutely love, like, all the four like very very clear points the it's kind of penultimate question that i had for you bob because you touched on it a little bit earlier and i just want to dig into it just a little more is um we live in a time of almost like information overload where we've got uh data and uh tool, so many tools all pulling into one place and we've we've talked a lot about of um kind of the the pr practical aspects of sales but given the amount of information that we have available to us now, what would you say are perhaps the, the three kind of most important pieces of data that you can use to um, improve and enhance your sales org? The, the most important thing I think is, is a way to um, clearly articulate and understand who your current customers are, who your most valuable customers are. And the data that you're looking for is often like right inside your own building if you just spend a little more time looking for it. Now I'll get into like how to go find it. So like that's things like, okay, let me go look at our, at our top, you know, 100 customers, whatever it might be. Uh, and I say top based on whatever factors are important to your business. It might be revenue, profitability, um, it's recurring revenue, you know, they continue to come back, or whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. Is to then start um, dissecting, you know, what, what there's the, the high level things that people do. You know, what industry are they in? What geography are they in? Stuff like that. What's, what's the size of their company? But going a couple levels deeper in th terms of like, what's their growth rate? Are they hiring often? Are they not hiring often? What is the, what is the profile of the buyer that we're working with? What's the profile of their executives? And I say profile, I mean like, what's their background? Are they growth-minded people? Are they more technical-minded people? Like, what are some of the characteristics? Why did this customer buy from the first place? What, what, is, the, what is the reason? What, what's the importance to us in their business? So just getting really, and I go really deep on this, you could spend an hour dissecting this. Like, and, and so the idea is like, is that now when I kind of identify those common characteristics to then use other pieces to say, all right, that's the profile. We've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but like my point is the first wave of data is inside your own business. You don't need a lot of outside tools to figure it out. You need good, solid, focused conversations to uncover what that really is. I'd also encourage you then to do the same thing. Like, we're the customers that we don't like to work with. They're inefficient. They're unprofitable. Like, we all have those too. we are not saying we're going to fire them. We all, again, it's easy to say that in a podcast interview, but I know the reality is like, it's not easy to do that. But if you also understand who to avoid, it just helps narrow down who to go after. So, so then in terms of, you know, back to your point, what are the, what's the research or data that you're looking for? Um, you know, that, that's where, where tools like LinkedIn and Zoom Info are so powerfully helpful, you know, because that's where you can really get into like finding those, those same kind of uh, those same sorts of people. Um, you know, we also know that, you know, there's all kinds of new capabilities with, with, with AI to go find those things more efficiently 
um, to kind of help tee up messaging, et cetera, that's tailored and kind of that has gives you a head start. Um, and I know more of those tools are coming out. Now, there's a there's a fascinating company that um, that I know of called Rule Five, and what they're doing is they kind of will help scan and, and through press releases for corporate documents, quarterly reports, et cetera, to help whittle down and identify like here's the most important information that you need to know. And so I think all kinds of new AI tools that are helping kind of assess all of those things are going to unearth like the right focus. And it gives you the, the data points so that you're not sending in a personalized email with name, title, and company names. It's, you know, referencing more specific things. And the thing is, those things take investment. They take time. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a believer that, hey, if you're going to send 100 emails a day, let's make it 10 and be more research because I think that's overdoing it. But I think there's a proper balance that maybe I can still do 100, but, or maybe I only do 80, but I'm going to spend just a little bit more time and investment in other tools that can help me kind of identify the right message and, and, and uh, deliver it that way. Yeah. As, as always, it's uh, nailing that balance between the two. Um, Bob, final question. What is one book that you would recommend to other revenue leaders and why? Yeah. Um, there, of course, there's always so many. Um, I'm reading books all the time. So I just, uh, I just finished Elon Musk's book by Walter Isaacson. Fascinating, insightful. Nice. Um, I just, you know, I'm now reading Jolt, which is a great sales book. Amazing research from the folks that did the Challenger Sale, Matt Dixon. So I'm always reading. I'm always learning, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I, I would say and I have a, on my blog, I've got a list of like my favorite, my top 10 favorites. Um, I, I'd say because you're, you're kind of forcing me to it, I'll highlight one of them, <laughs> um, uh, which is great, which is um, a book that came out a long time ago. It's called Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Um, and it's an easy read, which is always helpful to me. Um, and uh, it's so powerful for any leader out there that wants to get their team working more in a more unified way. Um, it has excellent you know, insights. It's written as a story, not as like a business book with just research. It's got a little bit of both. It's written as a story of another executive team who's going through this process with a kind of a consultant or a guide going, taking them through it. Um, and it just, it's really good about how to get a team working together, how to get people talking, how to set goals and priorities together, and then how to, how to have massive accountability going forward. And so as it gets into those five dysfunctions, it is things like alignment, communication, accountability, you know, some of the basic fundamentals that we often forget. And it just presents it in a way that's very easy to understand and, and gives you uh, methods in which to kind of make it your own. Amazing. I love that suggestion. And, and don't worry, Bob, I will put a link to your blog. Uh, in the show notes below. So if anyone wants to see any of your sure, other right. recommendations, um, you can check it out there. All right. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, just before we sign off, uh, for anyone listening that perhaps wants to listen to more of your uh, your advice, your insights, your experience, uh, where can they find you? Sure. Yeah. So um, you can uh, go to my website, meetbobmarsh.com. I've got a lot of information out there about my keynote speaking business. There's a lot of videos over the, out there that I think uh, that, that are helpful. I've also got an active blog with all kinds of very specific tactics and ideas. Um, so you can go there. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, easy to find, just uh, LinkedIn. My name is Bob Marsh. So it um, should be pretty easy to find me there. And I'm happy to connect. And uh, anyway, send me an email or right off my website. I'm happy to connect uh, in any way at any time to help anybody uh, with whatever they need. I just I love the industry and I'm always happy to happy to play a role in someone's success. Beautiful. Um, I'll make sure we put links down to this below. And if you do send Bob an email, make sure it's personalized. Otherwise, uh, he'll summarize <laughs> it with ChatGPT. Just make sure it's not long. <laughs> uh, well, that rules me out. Then I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bob, it's been an absolute pleasure. And to everyone that's listened this week, thank you so much. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>